Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Danny Haig, Assistant Director at CSET. Today, we'll discuss the factors critical to future advancements in AI, such as talent, compute, and data, and the relative importance of each. But first, a brief bit of housekeeping. All attendees' microphones are muted. If you're on a computer and experience any technical issues, use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to alert us, and a CSET team member will try to help you out. Please don't use the chat for anything else just yet. And now it's time to turn the mic over to our moderator, Tim Wong. Tim currently serves as a senior technology fellow at the Institute for Progress. His research focuses on meta science, comparative studies in emerging technologies, and grand strategy in science and technology policy. He previously served as a research fellow here at CSET and enrolls at the Harvard, MIT Ethics and Governance of AI Initiative and Google. Tim, over to you. Thanks, Danny. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining. Very excited to host this discussion. Um, I think one of the things that I'm sure many of you turning in will be familiar with is um, I think the degree to which sort of policy discussions around AI often fall into cliches, assumptions, right? So, um, you know, I'll, I'll name a few. Um, uh, AI is an arms race, right? Or um, the biggest model is the best model. Um, and I think today I'm particularly excited to um, host uh, this session with Micah uh, because I think this session is going to focus on taking on, I think, one of the biggest, I think, sacred cows of the AI policy discussion uh, that I think really has dominated discourse over the last few years. Um, and that assumption is that computing power is the most important factor um, in sort of AI advantage and progression of, of AI as a technology. Um, and so uh, very excited to host this discussion. Uh, Michael will speak for about um, uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so, um, and then we'll use the remainder of time for Q&A. Um, to quickly give an introduction to Micah, Micah is a research analyst uh, at Georgetown's uh, CSET with the Cyber AI Project, um, has done a bunch of super, super interesting work in the past, um, both on the research that he's going to present today, of course, uh, but also on um, a variety of questions, uh, including um, questions around uh, the application of AI, for example, in the in the disinformation um, context. Um, Mike is formerly uh, of uh, Georgetown um, and soon to be uh, in law school at NYU uh, coming up uh, next next year or this year, actually. So, um, Mike, over to you. All right. Thanks, Trim. Um, really fantastic introduction. As Tim said, I'm happy to be here. I'm very excited about this. So uh, real quick, I'm just going to pull up some slides here. Um, and I'll dive right in because I feel like we have uh, a ton of material, exciting material, hopefully to present. Um, so I've titled this presentation somewhat provocatively, How Important is Compute to the Future of AI? Challenging the Conventional Wisdom about Constraints on AI Progress. And Tim has already done a great job teeing up the idea that um, we are challenging some sort of conventional wisdom here. But just before I dive in, um, I'm going to, in terms of the agenda here, I'm going to briefly talk about the current policy background, the set of policies on AI that we've seen recently, and why it sort of suggests that there is this strong belief in the value of compute as the primary driver of AI progress. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the bases for why we have uh, that many people have that belief, and I'm going to talk specifically about some trends in computing usage among notable AI models, um, but with a focus on what some of the limitations of the existing knowledge that we have are. Um, and then I'll dive in and I'll talk about some recent survey work that we did here at CSET to try to evaluate this issue before closing up with sort of a teaser about the policy implications. I'm hoping that we'll get more into some of those in Q&A, but um, I'll largely stay away from them for the sake of my, my presentation itself. Before we dive in, just a little bit of, of level setting in terms of how we talk about AI policy. Um, there's this very common notion that has become a really useful analytical frame for thinking about targets of AI policy. And that is this concept called the AI triad. Um, this was discussed by the former uh, director of the Cyber AI Project, Ben Buchanan, back when he was at CSET, in this paper where he summed up modern AI in one sentence, which is that machine learning systems use computing power to execute algorithms that learn from data. And the basic idea here is that there's really three distinct inputs to AI progress. There's um, various types of data, either larger data sets, more curated data sets, application-specific data sets, 
There's improvements in algorithms, which in this context, we mean in a very general sense to include things like uh, the creation of new deep learning architectures. Uh, the transformer model, for instance, was discovered or invented, depending on how you view it, in 2017 and has been underlying most of the um, large language models that we've seen just in the past few years. And then finally, the third pillar of this column, I guess, is computing power, or compute for short. Um, and that basically has to do with the hardware, the semiconductors, the uh, specialized semiconductors, oftentimes abbreviated GPUs, which were originally developed for gaming systems, but have turned out to be very useful for AI systems as well. And the idea here is that all three of these factors are somehow important for driving AI progress. The differential value is debatable a lot of the time. That's really what we're going to be talking about here today. Um, but that these are three distinct places where policymakers can intervene. One thing this kind of leaves out, though, is the talent question, which I want to tee up because this will be a recurrent theme. And so um, it's possible to say, I think from a from an AI researcher's pr perspective, algorithms in particular is very tightly coupled with talent. You need talented researchers in order to develop new algorithms. But there's also a broader sense in which talent underlies all three of these. Um, even data, even if it's not researchers themselves labeling data, it's oftentimes large, large um, enterprises of people distributed around the world who are doing data labeling, at least for some AI cases. And computing power, progress in semiconductors, reshoring semiconductor capabilities, all of this also depends on talent. Um, so with that out of the way, I'm going to give a brief talk about basically where is the policy agenda on AI right now? My There we go. And as a framing device here, uh, I'm sure many people in the audience are familiar that the National Security Commission on AI released its final report in October of 2021. In that report, they outlined about a dozen high-level strategic objectives that the US should pursue to maintain an AI advantage. Um, and I've pulled out a few that were specifically related to actually being competitive in AI, as opposed to um, sort of ensuring that AI's benefits are distributed well. And there's a couple here I just wanted to briefly target. Um, so one high-level recommendation was that the U.S. should build a resilient domestic base for designing and fabricating microelectronics. And you see that very directly translate into policy with the Chips and Science Act last year, providing $50 billion in funding to reshore semiconductor capacity. Another high-level goal was to protect America's technology advantages, and the NSCAI specifically talked about this in terms of um, reconstructing Amer or, or reinvigorating, perhaps, America's export control system to better, uh, better track and maintain an advantage on that hardware side. And again, you see a direct translation into actual policy with the October 7 export controls on advanced GPUs last fall. And then the third here thing here um, is that uh, the NSCAI called for us to accelerate AI innovation at home. And specifically, it called for the government to create a national AI research resource, or abbreviated as ANAIR, um, that could provide resources for researchers, domestic researchers, to uh, further advance AI. And in January, a task force that was commissioned to study this proposal for ANAIR released its final report. They, they very heavily emphasize, and I want to be clear, that it's extremely important for the NAIR to provide both computing power and data to researchers. So it hits both of those columns. But uh, there's this line in that task force that does say the largest awards should be reserved for large computing investments with smaller caps defined for data and service awards. So this isn't an exclusive focus on compute, but this is still somewhat of a relative focus on compute compared to other levers. And then finally, uh, another high level recommendation was to win the global talent competition. And I say this because um, basically the point I wanna make here is that all of the NSCAI's recommendations that are tangibly related to hardware have pretty quickly been translated into actual policy. But it's on the global talent competition question where We've seen maybe the beginnings of analyses about domestic workforce development issues, K-12 education, but no real attempt to tackle things like um, increasing the H-1B caps for talented immigrants or those sorts of issues. So 
the the tee up here is to say to this point in time a lot of this policy making has been really really focused on this compute lever and it's possible you might say well possibly that's just because compute is the most important lever and there is a, a, an argument a strong argument for that um, the strong argument for that is my next slide um, I realize this slide is a bit busy, but the idea is not to look at each of these six graphics individually, but instead to, to view them sort of collectively. Each graphic here basically shows on the x-axis we have uh, time, years, and on the y-axis we have a measure of computing intensity, and each dot represents some notable model from the history of AI. And uh, this first the first version here came from OpenAI in 2019. They basically, all of these graphs show the same thing, which is that for most of the history of AI, there's a growth in computing demands of systems that roughly tracks Moore's law. But then in 2012, there's a sudden kink. And all of a sudden, these, these models start taking on massive amounts of computational requirements. Um, I, I show this with six different graphics not because the differences matter, but because basically uh, this was first noticed in open, by OpenAI in 2019, and then uh, significantly expanded in a really great data set compiled by some other researchers in 2022. The link at the top of the screen uh, will take you to their data, which they've done a fantastic job of compiling and making public. Um, but all, each of these graphics is sort of taken from a different AI policy group. So uh, there's OpenAI, an AI lab themselves. The second one is from a report that I myself co-authored about a year ago here at CSET. Another one comes from the Stanford HAI AI Index. One comes from the Center for the Governance of AI. Another comes from the State of AI Report. And the idea here is that it's a really compelling graphic. It shows that like the last decade of notable AI advances have really escalated how much computing requirements we're using. And it does tell you something really, really meaningful about how important compute was over the last decade. But, and this is now where I'm going to start shifting, I think that there's a risk that policymakers are over-indexing on this type of result for two reasons. The first one is that uh, in this report I, I authored last year, we took the trend line as it had been analyzed at that time um, and we said, what happens if we just project this forward in time? And we noticed that very, very quickly, um, because it was such a steep exponential curve, it, be it becomes infeasible to keep scaling at this rate. Um, in fact, we noticed that as early as 2026, we should be seeing, based on just extrapolating this trend line, AI models that cost the entire US GDP just to train. Um, and I'll note that this trend line is assuming that prices of the cost of compute halves every two years, consistent with Moore's law. Um, and so there's a risk here of saying, basically what we argued in this paper was we said, um, massively scaling up compute really drove a ton of the last decade of AI progress. But it probably can't, con it almost certainly actually can't continue at the same rate, which means one of two things. Either we will see a general slowdown in AI advances, or people are going to have to shift strategies, either find more efficient algorithms or more specialized versions of these large models. Something might have to shift, even if just on the margins, to make this trend line not so unsustainable. The other risk with some of this data, um, these, this data showing the skyrocketing AI compute usage, is that it's unclear how reflective it is of all AI work versus just a few models. Uh, and so what I did on this slide is I took that, that data set I mentioned that had been um, compiled by some folks at the Center for the Governance of AI, and they had about 160 models where they had information about the model's compute usage. So I took that, the, those, uh, those models and I broke them out into different tiers. And I said, within which type of tier, within each tier, sorry, uh, which type of models are represented. And what you see here is that the most compute intensive models that we're talking about are to a large extent, almost overwhelmingly actually language models. Um, so a lot of the recent trend of this explosion in compute needs is being very, very heavily driven by language models specifically. Um, it's unclear though, 
it's not the case that uh, two thirds, three quarters of AI researchers right now are just doing language modeling. And so it's unclear what these trends say about AI as a whole, as opposed to a specific subset of one AI application area. And we noticed this about a year and a half ago, and we thought, hey, it would be really great to study this in more depth. How do we go about doing it? To answer that, we decided that the best way to, to, to study this would be to run a survey, a survey of AI researchers. Uh, and so last summer, we fielded this survey. Um, we had two target populations. Most of our, our respondents came from um, basically anyone, it says, the slide says academics, but really this does include some people at industry, um, anyone who had published uh, in a top AI conference between 2016 and 2021. And using some of CSET's data, we extracted about 27,000 emails associated with someone who had met that criteria. And then we also, to get, um, because that, that population includes a meaningful number of industry, but it is academia dominated. So we also augmented this with some sampling of industry people based on the, the LinkedIn criteria that you can see on the screen. Uh, when we fielded this survey, we got a total of 533 total results. Um, I believe that there's been about 10 attempts or so to field surveys of AI researchers as a population. And to my knowledge, this is the second largest survey of that population conducted yet. Uh, so we were pretty pleased with that result. You can see the breakdown on the right-hand side of the screen between academia and industry. And the other thing I'll say is that uh, based on the domains of our respondents from academia, we, we mapped each university to its QS world ranking. And we have a basically an even division three ways between researchers at a top 50 university, researchers at a university ranked 51 to 200, and researchers at a lower ranked university. And then also a, a small percentage that were affiliated with an unranked university, which is why those numbers don't add up to 100. Um, this did, I think, give us a lot of uh, a broad reach across many types of academics. Um, it's not totally representative, but it's it's pretty representative. It's a much broader reach of academics than maybe policymakers are ordinarily exposed to. So we fielded the survey. The goal was to evaluate for each AI researcher how important is compute, especially as compared to other factors as part of their research agenda. And so one thing we asked researchers was, if we doubled the budget for your current project, what would you spend the extra money on? And what we saw is that over half of our respondents said that they would spend that money on hiring either more engineers or more researchers. And only a fifth said that they would spend it on uh, purchasing more compute. And so just briefly, I think that immediately this sort of raises questions about, well, okay, there's certainly a subset of models that is exploding in compute requirements and where it's getting more and more costly to purchase enough compute to, to train, for instance, uh, a GPT-3, a GPT-4. But um, this is a first indication that that might not actually be the types of projects that most researchers are working on. And we also see this in other ways. So we asked our researchers as well, how often have you rejected a project, revised a project, or abandoned a project because of a lack of either compute, data resources, or researcher availability. And again, we found this result that sort of surprised us, which is that uh, in each of these three hypotheticals, compute was the least cited reason for why uh, academics are forced to change their research plans by pretty substantial margins, especially for rejected and abandoned. Um, and so again, this sort of suggests that there's, again, a subset of models where compute is really important, but focusing just on compute as a policy lever is maybe missing the needs of a potentially even broader population of AI researchers. We also asked our researchers, uh, we gave them five different factors, things like more compute, better algorithms, and so on, and we asked them, how strongly do you agree that this factor drove the last decade of AI progress? And then we also ask them, how strongly do you agree that this factor will drive the next decade of AI progress? And what we saw is that 
um, of all the factors, compute scored the highest when researchers thought about the last decade. That is to say, 59% of researchers said, yes, I strongly agree that compute heavily drove the last decade of AI progress. But it was actually the, the uh, factor where the lowest percentage strongly agreed that it would drive the next decade of AI progress. And at the same time, the percent saying that better algorithms would become more important rose pretty dramatically. Um, there are a number of ways you could interpret this result. For the sake of time, I'm not going to dwell on it, although I'm happy to come back in Q&A. Um, but again, it's a, a sort of suggestion that, hey, relying on these historical trends is maybe not the best way for conceptualizing what the needs of AI are moving forward in time. Um, and so I'm going to pause with, with this, or sorry, I'm going to end with this slide here. Three high-level questions. They're not yet drilling down into specific policies. Um, but first of all, I think one thing I, I want to highlight here is that oftentimes it's just sort of said, well, deep learning is compute intensive. And that is true. But there's a lot of variation between different subfields of AI, including different subfields that use deep learning, and a lot of variation within subfields, how compute intensive different research projects are. Um, and so when we talk about policies that impact compute, we're not always talking about policies that impact all types of AI research. We need to be careful about thinking about which types of applications we're most heavily impacting especially because, again, as I mentioned, language models are in some ways a unique AI application that seems uniquely compute intensive, at least at this point in time. Uh, it's possible that other fields will, uh, attention will pivot and other fields will become more compute intensive. But right now, when we talk about the really, really compute intensive models, we're primarily talking about language models. The second high level question here is, um, oftentimes, people also talk about compute divides between industry and academia, the inability of academia to keep up with industry. And again, I think that there's an ambiguity here because people aren't always clear, um, are we talking about a systematic divide where industry as a whole demographic systematically has access to more compute than academia? Or are we worried about the influence of a small number of big tech companies that are particularly well-resourced when it comes to compute? Because these might actually translate into very different policy interventions, um, which again, I, I, I'm running out of time, so I'll just sort of tease that. And then finally, if it's the case that it's an intrinsic property of all types of deep learning research that they require tons and tons of compute, then oftentimes it makes sense to think, well, okay, then the way to get AI progress is that we just have to keep throwing more and more compute at these projects as long as we can. But if it's instead the case that there's a lot of variation in what projects researchers might take on, um, throwing compute at the problem will end up benefiting particularly compute intensive research plans while not so much helping others. And I think we ought to start asking ourselves, is that actually the outcome we want? Uh, instead of just assuming that everything needs more compute, we maybe need to get a little more careful about asking, is that, do we actually want to encourage compute intensive projects or do we want to encourage the type of research that might generate more efficient ways of doing the same tasks? Um, I realize I'm leaving it pretty high level here, but I'm about 21 minutes into this talk. Um, and so the way I want to, the, the real message that I want to end on, again, I, I open by saying AI policy is increasingly focused on this compute lever. Oftentimes even maybe to the, um, oftentimes as a substitution away from other levers we might be pulling, like talent focused ones. Um, and I think that this is just not the right approach. It's good to a certain extent. It's many. It's very valuable to pursue a lot of these compute-focused interventions, but they are not a substitution for talent-focused policy. Uh, talent policy includes lots of domestic efforts, things like uh, workforce development, uh, leveraging the, the talented community colleges, uh, K-12 education. These are all topics CSET has written on. 
But it's also, those are all largely medium term interventions. In the short term, the shortest way to address this talent gap is by welcoming more immigrants to the US, more high talented immigrants. And that I think uh, it's oftentimes gotten too easy to imagine that, well, if all AI driven, I apologize, stumbling over my words here a bit in the home stretch, it's gotten a bit easy to say, if all AI pro progress is just driven by compute, then we don't need to think as much about talent or about immigration. And I think that that is very much the wrong way to approach AI policy. These are all levers we need to think about, and we cannot use one as a substitute for handling the others. So on that note, um, I'm going to stop my, my screen sharing and Tim, uh, jump in and, and start peppering me with questions. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, thanks, Micah. That was great. Um, so uh, if you do want to get a Q&A or a question rather into the discussion, um, what you need to do is just drop it in the webinar chat. Um, our sort of events team will be able to be collating those questions as Micah and I are talking, um, and, uh, and we'll bring them into the discussion. But I guess, Micah, to, to start, maybe get a, to get us rolling um, while people are kind of thinking about what they might want to ask. I think, you know, obviously, I think the position that you've put out, you've recognized it as such is, is a little bit provocative. And I think to get the discussion going, I, I do want to kind of take the other side a little bit, you know, pressure some parts of this argument, think about where it works, where it doesn't work, where, um, you know, uh, and ultimately, I think what it means for, for policy. I think the first question I'd ask you is, you know, I'm kind of putting the hat on of being like a large language model booster, right? Mm -hmm. Where you say, Mike, it's all very well and good to say that AI is very broad and there's lots of people doing things that don't involve any compute. But look, like the hugest, most important breakthrough in AI um, in the last few years has been language models. And to the extent that we are worried about sort of the US's um, advantage in the technology, we need to be working on the most important thing, right? It's a bet that's clearly paying off and it's the most critical. And so, you know, what do you say to someone who I think kind of takes a look at your results and says, yeah, this is all very well and good, but from a national interest standpoint, the thing that we really need to be kind of, you know, accelerating on right now is precisely the thing that is, you know, uh, compute intensive. Yeah, so um, it's a, it's a fantastic question. I mean, that's the immediate and um, obvious pushback is to say, well, okay, um, sure, maybe language models are the most compute intensive, but they're also the most important. So of course, we just want to focus more there. Um, and I suppose there are there's there's two ways I could respond to that. One way is to question just how strategically valuable language models are. Um, and I think that, frankly, I don't want to get down too far in that rabbit hole, but uh, there are reasonable questions about, so for instance, this arms race frame. Uh, it's very easy to say, oh, well, you know, language models could be economically transformative in the US. Uh, we're all very worried about them. They're in the news. We're constantly paying attention. Therefore, it must be the case that China also views this as a critical technology and they're racing okay. as quickly as possible to get there. And I would say, well, first of all, um, the Chinese state very quickly moved to release regulations that would pretty heavily dampen the ability of companies to deploy these, at least in the way that they're being deployed in the US. And so I think that there's a sort of question of like, what if the what if the Chinese government doesn't actually view this with the same level of strategic importance? Um, and you can play that out more. You can say, well, China's actually much more of a manufacturing economy. So to the extent that there is an economic payoff from something like language models, it probably disproportionately benefits service economies like the US and less so manufacturing economies like China. Um, and so there's basically where I'm going there is just you might question, okay, sure, language models, very important. Um, is it the case that China also sees it that way? Or are they focused on other types of AI research that perhaps aren't as compute intensive? That mm. alters the national security calculus a little bit. The other response I could make is that uh, on the domestic front, in terms of which type of which type of technology do we want to encourage, you could certainly say, well, language models are just the most important. That's what we ought to be encouraging. And the response I would give there is just that that's a little abnormal when it comes to <laughs> the way that we fund science research, which is that usually we try not to prejudge which types of basic research are the most valuable. 
We instead try to give out resources to academics pretty broadly across many, many different types of applications in the hopes that eventually one of those will sort of demonstrate utility in such a way that industry picks it up and expands it at scales that academia can't. Um, and so from that perspective, I would say like, yeah, you can certainly argue that like, no, we have enough information to conclude language models are the one that matters. That's where all the government funding should be going into resources that help language models. Um, but my pushback is just to say that usually that's not how we do science funding in the US. And in some ways, that's actually a pretty significant break from the normal process. Yeah, definitely. So I see these uh, questions that are coming in. They're they're really, really great. And I think I would encourage you to, to drop your uh, hat in the ring uh, if you want, Micah, to kind of consider one of them. Um, I think as people kind of come in, I, I think it does make sense maybe to build on one audience question here. Uh, so Tom Dieterich, uh, hey, Tom, I think we met many years ago. It's good to, to hear from you. Um, I think has a really interesting comment about the different timescales of the policy levers here. Right. So I think the point that he made in his question was, look, we, there's a lot of things we can do for compute that will impact the strategic environment right now. Right. Mm -hmm. We can export control. That totally changes the nature of the industry overnight. Yeah. Whereas while we can all agree with talent, you know, it's an important feature. We shouldn't see this as and I don't think you're arguing that they are mutually exclusive. But, you know, if we're worried about, say, let's just put it out there, competitiveness with China. Right. Are we worried that talent is maybe too slow of a lever here? Right. And so maybe yeah. one response is to say, Look, you know, I agree with you, talent's really important, but compute is ultimately the thing that we need in this kind of critical moment where we want advantage, and it's the tool that will get us the most impact right away. Um, do you buy that? I'm curious about how do you respond yeah, to that? So um, the, the, one, the one response I would give is that uh, it is the case that ideally these, these operate as complementary policies. Um, I have, however, had multiple conversations with people who are involved in policy making uh, and I certainly won't name names here but but conversations where I've presented the results of, of this survey and I've and they've said like you know what's the one sentence summary and I've said something to the effect of like compute is great but maybe we should be spending more attention on talent especially immigration as a short-term intervention and they've said in response oh I can't tell my boss that um, and so I've, I've started to wonder, like, in an ideal world, these are complementary. But I also think that there's actually a risk that uh, given political constraints, we start to view them as substitutionary. Like, oh, you know, great, AI progress depends on compute. That means I don't have to touch immigration. Um, and I don't have to tell anyone that we need more immigrants. And in a very, you know, heightened political environment where that is a sort of dangerous message to say to, to send, you get a risk. There are clear incentives, I think, to sort of over-index on the value of compute, despite its, its importance and its relevance. And the other, the other response that I would give um, in terms of, yeah, compute is maybe a, a very short-term intervention. Um, K-12 education is relatively long-term, talent uh, immigration is much shorter term, but it's still relatively, I mean, you're talking a few years here. Um, the answer to that is that I'm not convinced that we are in a crisis moment right now. I think that chat GPT has certainly galvanized a ton of attention, but uh, I don't, it's not the type of technology where, you know, um, chat GPT gives some sort of decisive strategic advantage to the first military that starts to ask the chatbot uh, which types of military operations they should do. That is not really a, a sort of risk that I'm concerned about. I think that the payoffs have much more to do with economic automation, economic improvements. Um, and in many ways, it's actually fortunate that uh, large language models, which are somewhat more indirect of a national security risk, were the type of model to generate this breakthrough. The, the caveat to that is that I, I acknowledge a lot of the disinformation risks. I have personally done a lot of, of research on the use of AI for disinformation and for influence operations. And I'll say there that based on my assessment, I'm happy to talk more. I think that right now people are more in danger of overinflating the risk than they are of underinflating it, but happy to, to either address that in a different question or I, I know we're getting a lot of questions, so I wanna move on.
Yeah, no, definitely. That's all great. So one other final question using my prerogative, um, and I think it's related to the question that um, Derek Slater is asking here in the chat. Um, I am sort of really interested in not just thinking about these two things, that is to say compute policies and levers and talent levers as being complementary, but also in some ways like interdependent in some ways. Mm -hmm. So I think there's one way of looking at it, which is maybe another slice, which is like a wouldn't you agree that um, you know being able to access these incredibly rare, powerful computing clusters is one reason why talented researchers might move to the US, right? Yeah. Um, there's also these really interesting questions about whether or not policy around compute, and I'm now talking about, say, like NAIR style approaches, um, is important for leveling the playing field, right? You could say, okay, well, maybe immigrants and talent, they really want to move to the country if they think they can do an AI startup that can really go compete with the best of them, right? Open AI or, or what have you. And so what we need is, is, you know, say public research clouds to be able to kind of like open up the space for it even to be worth it for us to be able to leverage talent in the first place. And I guess I'm kind of curious, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not really pressuring the argument, but I am kind of want to hear sort of your view on how these two are almost kind of related variables in some ways, and that there are almost ways of doing compute policy, which are kind of talent policy in some sense. Yeah, I, so first level answer, I would say, yes, absolutely. Um, although in order for that to pay off, you actually have to have a high enough cap on skilled immigrants that people can respond to that signal and decide to come to the U.S., um, but on this on this point about the the NAIR sort of equalizing the playing field, uh, one other interesting, really fascinating result from our survey I'll, I'll talk about briefly here. Um, we do see that like AI projects have tons and tons of variation in how much compute different projects need. Um, that is, I think, you know, our survey supports that. That's abundantly true across basically any way you try to look at it. Um, and so there's a question of like, why is there so much variation? And broadly, I would say there's two ways you might go, go about answering that. One is to say, well, it's access that governs how much compute people use, i.e. everyone would like to be doing really compute intensive work, but there's tons of stratification in how much access people have. And so many researchers are just forced to do other types of work. The other broad types of explanation you might offer has to do with self-selection effects, which is to say, look, different subfields, different methods within subfields have a lot of variance in how much payoff you get for expanding compute. And so what happens here is that researchers select into one type of, of research, maybe that initial selection is governed by access. But then once they're in a like low compute research project, it doesn't actually help them to just throw more compute at their problem. Um, and so an interesting thing that we observed in this survey is that uh, actually the respondents who expressed the most concern about not having enough compute to do meaningful work in the future were the same respondents who reported using the most compute right now. Um, and we got that result actually across a number of indicators. So like the more compute you use, the more important you thought compute was in the past, the more important you think compute will be in the future, the more likely you'd be to spend more money on compute, et cetera. And this I think suggests that like people have been assuming something of the, the access explanation, which is like, oh, if we just give more compute to everyone, people will use it and that will reduce the inequalities in how much compute different researchers use. It might actually be the case that the reverse is somewhat true, which is that the people who are most motivated to make use of new compute resources are the people already using a lot of compute. Um, and so in that case, if you just give everyone access to more compute, what you actually do is you increase the stratification between how much compute different projects use. Maybe that's worth it. Maybe the more compute intensive projects, as we talked about, are just more valuable. And so uh, it's worth doing that. Um, but I do think like this is a sort of call to the research community. I think that we've been way too simplistic about just saying like, is compute important? Isn't it compute? Isn't it important? I'm much more interested in asking like, who benefits differentially from compute focused interventions? Because that, I think, gets us into a frame of talking about like, hey, certain ways of implementing these, um, these types of policies do create relative winners and relative losers. And we actually want to be certain that that's what we are doing before we try to pursue that policy.
or sorry, we want to be certain that that's what we want to do before we go ahead and we do it. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I, I guess, I don't know, uh, to return to, I think, a result that you are talking about a little bit earlier, like sort of like, like it or not, right? Like we're going to hit a ceiling on compute because pe things just can't grow at the rate that they have been, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you're almost forced into a situation at some point, which is, okay, except that we do all the compute stuff, we dominate compute. You know, your projections would say, well, we just expect that things are not going to grow the way they have been like 36 months from now, essentially. Right. Um, which I think is a, is a really uh, interesting and um, an important result. Um, one kind of question maybe that you can maybe speak to now, um, uh, Quentin um, in the chat had a quick question, which is now kind of flipping the analysis kind of like on the other side of the triad to basically say, okay, we've been talking a lot about compute. We've been talking a lot about talent. Yeah. Um, I guess, Micah, do you want to sound off for a second on your views about data uh, as, a, as a lever in this space? Um, right, because that's the that's the kind of last bit of the triangle you've not talked yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm no, curious absolutely. about like if you feel similarly around some of these issues, right? Which is like maybe we're too obsessed with data, or maybe we're not obsessed with data enough. Like, interested in kind of just having you maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So there was certainly there was a, a moment maybe three or four years ago where big data was the solution to AI progress that we would just make data sets bigger. Um, and uh, I, I, I think in some sense, like the reason that things are framed so much in terms of compute in this presentation is because we've clearly moved on from that, um, at least within the policy circles that I happen to be able to, to observe. We're no longer talking about big data. We're talking about controlling access to hardware. Um, but, but data is the third leg here. And so uh, I do actually think data becomes especially relevant not just when we're talking about like self-supervised self large-scale language models, but whenever we want to talk about like, what are the socially valuable applications of AI that we really want? Oftentimes the constraint ends up being not compute, um, which may be necessary to, to train some sort of large foundation model, but in the last stage of actually getting true economic utility out of that, you need a meaningful enough data set that you can fine tune that model on some socially useful purpose. Uh, and a great example here is like, you might have a great vision classifier, right? That can, can work with all 1000 categories from ImageNet. Um, that is really meaningful as a research, uh, a, a research breakthrough, if you improve that, although ImageNet has been saturated, you know, et cetera. Um, but to, to translate that into something like a medical diagnostic tool, those thousand categories from the ImageNet data set are not the right thousand categories. You do need some sort of well-curated additional data. And so I would say this is probably like, in terms of government interventions uh, that we could do to, to boost research progress, I do think a broad answer is to say, well, if there's ambiguity about what types of resources are most valuable, then perhaps the best way to provide it is in the form of grants and let researchers themselves decide how to use that money. And the exception to that is well curated data sets that only the government can put together. So that's that's the exception where I think I see the most utility of like a concerted whole of government effort to boost AI is to coordinate between agencies, gather all the meaningful data set, all the all the meaningful data sets, create a system that allows structured and tiered access to it, um, so that different research projects can work with different data sets of different levels of sensitivity, and then you know basically see what happens, see what kind of applications we get out of that that can be translated into having a lot of economic utility. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so for the next question, I'm going to join a couple of comments and questions that have come into the chat, um, largely kind of drawing on Rahini's comments and, and Tom's recent comment. I, I think it's almost a question about how you account for the difference here, right? So clearly, we have a lot of policy discussion in DC, which is very compute focused. Um, and, uh, and then at the same time, we have your survey, which talks to a bunch of researchers and says, actually, we don't care that much about compute. And I'm kind of curious about how you account for the difference, right? I think implicit in what you're arguing is, well, maybe the policymakers in DC have it wrong, or maybe they're listening to the wrong people. We should be listening to the researchers, I think is maybe a subtext of what you're arguing. And I think some people would say, well, 
like a look, like your response rate was super low on your survey. How can we trust that this is actually giving us good signal on where we, we should be moving? Yeah. And I guess I'm curious about how you reconcile, like, I think it's a two part question. One of the questions is like, how did we end up in this place where compute is such a focus of the policy discussion? And the second one would be, how would you respond to people who say, look, this survey is just not very representative. Like you're, you're getting yes. just some weird noise and the people who happen to respond and maybe the people who are responding are so far, you know, in the wilderness in the space that, you know, they have lots of incentive to argue that the current kind of, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, orthodoxy is wrong. So, so I'll, I'll respond to the um, the question about the survey. We've gotten this, this, um, this comment about, well, the response rate was too low uh, a couple of times. Um, and it's, it, it's worth addressing, although, there are there are reasons that the response rate is low that I can tell you, which is, for instance, like I said, we used CSET's data to pool tons of emails of anyone who had published in one of these top AI venues. Um, we knew going into it that like we were confident that each of those emails was associated with someone who had done meaningful AI work at some point. And we also asked a screener at the start of the survey to confirm that the respondent works on AI systems. But we couldn't ensure that, for instance, like that's an email that is still actively being monitored. Um, and so we went into this knowing that a lot of the emails we were going to send this to weren't there. There was just no world in which people would respond. Um, and so I think that that artificially makes the response rate seem rather low. What matters much more than the response rate is the raw count of response that we got. Um, and again, I, I mentioned this in the in the presentation itself. I think that. To my knowledge, this is the second largest survey that's ever been conducted of AI researchers. I'm very pleased with that. Um, we also have a meaningful, you know, I mentioned that we have basically equal representation across three different tiers of academia. Um, because of privacy issues, we didn't ask a ton of personal identifying information that would allow us to exhaustively check the representativeness. So there's certainly ambiguity but we're pretty confident in the main results of the survey. To the other question about like, why is this gap existing? One potential explanation I might give you is going back to this result that the people who use the most compute are the most concerned about compute. And I think that there's a possible explanation you can give here, uh, which admittedly is speculative. So I I'm not gonna like claim that this is true. But I think it's reasonably likely that the academics who happen to have the most access to compute work at relatively elite institutions and are disproportionately likely to have connections in DC, which means like to the extent that there's um, a directionality of the bias, I would expect policymakers in DC to be hearing more about compute than what the median AI researcher says. Again, you might respond and just say, well, researchers at elite institutions know better what type of AI research is valuable. So who cares if they have a sort of biased perspective? That's a totally fair uh, response that someone might make. But I do think that like, you can see how you might get these gaps in communication creep up just based on the results of the survey that we did collect. Yeah, that's a, that's a great response. And I think building a little bit on that, um, I'm going to go to a question that I think, Duncan, you asked quite early um, in the session. Sorry, my cat. Um, uh, you asked quite early in the session, um, which is, I think, one hypothesis you can draw about why DC is most interested in compute is kind of that it's the most controllable thing in some ways, right? Where you're like, we can pull yeah. the export control lever and things can just happen. And so yeah. you kind of like, well, you use, you use the levers that you're given and that are most accessible and you sort of grab at them. Um, and I think there has been maybe a notion that this is a particularly good lever because the greatest sort of like threat and danger comes from these big, powerful models, right? Mm -hmm. And you can read that however you want, right? Like you can read that in the, the X-risk sense. You can read that in the sense of the work that you've done in the past, right? Which is these models seem to enable a certain kind of disinformation that we might want to be concerned about. Um, and I guess I'm kind of curious about like if you, you know, that this is zooming out a little bit from the point of view of competitiveness and policy to talking more about like managing risk. But do you think that assumption will continue to hold, right? Which is basically that like powerful AI systems that need to be built in large computing clusters are where most of the risk is. And that's mm -hmm. where we need to be focusing most of our time. Or is that kind of historically provisional, or is it not even true right now, right? Like I'm kind of curious about how you kind of weigh those threats. And, you know, as we kind of think about like, why we might want to be focused on certain levers over others. 
Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I'm going to use this as my uh, my point to explicitly plug the survey and say, you know, there's a ton of discussion in there. There's a ton of results we I just don't have time for in this context. And so um, to this point from Duncan, we start out the conclusion by saying, look, there's three broad reasons why compute has become really influential as a as a, a an anchoring, a, a, an anchor, basically. One is the belief that it's critical to AI breakthroughs. A second is the belief that there's really stratified access between different demographics. And a third is like, hey, it's easy. It's physical. We can look at it. We can hold it. We can export control it. We can do these sorts of things that it's much harder to do for data in the abstract. Um, and we're very clear, like the to the extent that we think this, the survey does say things about points one and two in that, that breakdown, we're not saying that like somehow these survey results mean that uh, the political barriers to talent disappear. Um, those are still very real. And Relative, like this is an argument why you might focus some level of compute uh, of attention on compute, even disproportionate to the potential impact it has. All well and good. I'll reiterate, I don't think it's a substitution for talent policy. We need to also think about that. But the other point is, um, so the other the other thing you raised is like, is it actually the case that these largest scale models are the most dangerous? Um, and in an X-risk sense, I mean, you might hypothetically say if we keep scaling them up, we get totally unforeseen difficulties, totally unforeseen capabilities that are very, very worrisome. Um, there's another way of looking at it, though. If we think about other types of risks like the disinformation risk, I think two other pieces of recent evidence that support the narrative I'm giving you is that one, we had Sam Altman say a few weeks ago uh, just scaling the parameter count of these models is not a feasible way forward for open AI. That's slightly different than saying not scaling compute is not a feasible way forward because there's a difference there. But the other piece of evidence was this leaked um, Google internal memo that was circulated, the we have no moat argument. Um, and the argument that was being advanced there was basically like, look, we can train these giant advanced language models um, they can be super versatile, super generalizable. They maybe they have 100 billion, 500 billion, a trillion parameters. If someone can take a 20 billion parameter and with a bit of fine tuning, replicate the capability on any discrete use task of this generalizable model, the economics of training those massive models gets totally blown out the window. Um, and with the disinformation stuff, one of the things that I'm working on is some cost modeling that I do think suggests for a lot of disinformation operators, it might actually, the preferred method of producing disinformation might be to use smaller models that are easier to run and where you can fine tune them yourselves instead of trying to access something like GPT-4 behind a paywall. Um, and so in that sense, I would say, I, I guess the, the succinct way of summing that all up is um, there may be these risks that are associated with the largest models. But it may also be the case that other types of risks are diffusing to other types of models. And so simply locking down the largest models is perhaps not a viable way to fully counteract those types of risks. Great, um, perfect answer. And I think there's a lot more we can go into there. Um, so we are essentially at time. Um, I'd advise everybody to read the paper. As Micah mentioned, there's a lot more that you didn't have a chance to get into. Um, but. Um, yeah, please reach out to him with any questions. And I, at this point, I'll turn it back to Danny to, to close us out. Awesome. Thanks, Tim, for moderating today. And thanks to Micah for a fascinating and provocative discussion. Thanks also to all of you for taking part in this discussion and for your comments and questions. We're sorry we couldn't get to them all. If you'd like to learn more about CSET, please go to cset.georgetown.edu and sign up for our newsletter and research updates. We'll be in touch soon with details on our next webinar, so be sure to watch your inbox. Until then, thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a good day. Thank you.